Okay, we are on, we are on live. Okay. So, uh, can I start, sir? Yeah. Hello and good afternoon to all our viewers and our honorable guest, Dr. Jinsen. And welcome back to our MASA webinar series where we focus on providing you quality content and a continuing dental education. Today's seminar is all about minor surgical procedures and our guest lecture is from Chennai, Dr. Jimson, Jimson Sanson. Uh, before we begin, let me give you a short introduction to our guest for our speaker to all. Dr. Jimson is uh, currently a, a head professor and head of the Department of Oral Surgery at Tagore Dental College, Chennai. He, is, he pursued his uh, BDS and MDS from MGR, Dr. MGR Medical University, Chennai. He has several international and national uh, publications which, where he has delivered lectures nationally and internationally. He is also a faculty for the course of maxillofacial trauma uh, and AO faculty of sleep apnea and uh, ORP, that is uh, operating, operating room personnel. He has attended various laser symposium in Germany and also conducted a lot of implant courses, which he, which he was trained in France. He has organized various workshops like human bioethics and conducted various implant workshops, like I said earlier. He is an EC member of Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons of India, that is AOMSI. He is an honorary state secretary of uh, Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeries uh, and chairman of uh, chairman of the Institute of Research Committee, Tagore Dental College. And he is also involved with the academics, extensively involved with academics. He is into syllabus revamp committee uh, for oral and maxillofacial surgery in Tamil Nadu, Dr. MGR Medical uh, University. He's also been an examiner for various uh, undergraduate and postgraduate studies. Like uh, before we begin with our study, uh, presentation, I would like to reiterate our viewers that what are the key takeaways from our from this lecture? That would be basic. Uh, basics or fundamentals of minor oral surgical procedures, must know tips during surgical intervention, and common problems faced during minor surgical procedures and techniques to overcome them. Okay, again, uh, please drop in your questions if you have in the comment box uh, that will be answered during the QA session. Well, without much further delay, I request Dr. Jimson to take go ahead with his presentation. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ravindranath, for the uh, introduction. Uh, at the very outset, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, Masa University the Faculty of Dentistry, uh, Dean Professor Rosna Zain, uh, Department of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery, and uh, Dr. Pratap Chanda and Dr. Patmanavakumar for giving me this opportunity uh, in this August platform to speak about uh, minor oral maxillofacial surgery. Uh, uh, yeah. So what are the principles of uh, oral, uh, I mean, minor oral surgery? No treatment will be complete without a proper diagnosis. And unless otherwise you diagnose this right, you cannot uh, arrive at a proper treatment planning. So once that you have a good treatment planning, you need to prepare the patient. You should have a very good preoperative preparation. And then the procedure itself, and then the postoperative care. If you don't, as I mentioned earlier, if you do not arrive at the proper diagnosis, you're bound to fail. So your the success of the treatment starts right at the beginning with the diagnosis. And what do you mean by diagnosis? I'm not going into the detail. Uh, it is to uh, in the determination of the nature of the disease. And treatment planning is nothing but you need to follow a particular sequence of procedures, plan for the treatment after the diagnosis is made. And what are the checklists that is uh, required uh, before you start the procedure? First and foremost is the informed consent. 
from the patient before you do anything, any procedure. Then you make the patient comfortable, both physically and relaxed. The cooperation of the patient is of utmost importance to get uh, to give a quality care to the patient. Uh, followed by anesthesia, you can either do it under local anesthesia uh, with a, a patient sedated or without sedation, depending upon what the patient, uh, the comfort zone is. And then the information uh, should be uh, recorded, including the case records and the radiographs. These are all very important before you start the procedure. And very important aspect of the surgical procedure is a well-trained and well-informed assistant. A uh, surgeon alone is not sufficient unless otherwise you have a good assistant, you will not be able to do justice to the patient. Then comes the surgeon. Yes, a very good preoperative plan, a surgical plan, and plan B as well. Some contingency plans in place because sometimes on the table you can have uh, an untoward incident or anything can happen. So you should always be ready with plan B. So what are the equipments that are required? Uh, the elimination is very, very important. You should have a very good, good suction apparatus and all the instruments that are required for the procedure and the dressings and the medicaments following the procedure. So these are the stages of uh, the surgical procedure of operation sequence. First is a retraction, followed by incision, reflection, the bone removal, uh, you, you need to have an access, a point of elevation and removal of any obstruction in case if there is uh, uh, obstruction removal of the tooth. Uh, in case if there is any obstruction, then you can go ahead with the sectioning of the tooth rather than removing more amount of bone, uh, followed by delivery of the tooth. And debridement, that is another very important aspect. You cannot leave any uh, residual bone chips or tooth chips, or you need to do a good debridement uh, to avoid any post-operative complication. Then you switch at the uh, uh, surgical site, followed by checkup and follow. -up. That is very, very important. And uh, this is a quote uh, which goes like uh, this. The operation is finished when the patient stops complaining. So till such time, the surgeon cannot relax unless otherwise the patient comes back to you post-operatively telling that the patient is free of any pain or discomfort or whatever it is. So what are the most common post-operative uh, problems that you can come across? One is a premature removal of the sutures. Uh, there are again controversies which says that you can remove the stitch in one day, five days, seven days. So I'm not going into the controversies. Uh, another important complication is the dry socket, restricted mouth opening in case if the procedure is uh, a surgical removal of a third molar. Uh, pain and swelling, it is bound to be there for any surgical procedure. Uh, and you should explain to the patient that it is very much normal. Yes, you can give medications to keep this pain and swelling to a minimum uh, to make the patient comfortable. Hemorrhage, it can be an intraoperative or postoperative. Uh, intraoperative, yes, there are various methods which, which you can uh, manage the intraoperative hemorrhage. And you can also have alteration sensation in case if uh, there is some damage or uh, to the nerve during the procedure. Now, coming to the uh, procedure per se, uh, what are the procedures that are covered under minor uh, surgical procedures? Uh, Removal of uh, retained roots, a very common procedure done by the dental surgeons. Uh, third molar removal, it again, a very, very, very common procedure done by the oral maxillofacial surgeons. So I, I would rather say it is a, a bread and butter of uh, maxillofacial surgery. Endodontic procedures, endodontic, I'm sorry, endodontic uh, surgeries, uh, APG sectomies, uh, for orthodontic considerations like orthodontic extractions, preprosthetic surgeries. Uh, the enucleation uh, of uh, cysts, uh, biopsy procedures, uh, closure of uh, oroantral fistula. 
Uh, coming to the procedures, uh, uh, this is an example which is taken by a, in, uh, from a textbook where you can see a lateral incisor, a uh, root stem of a lateral incisor, a uh, root canal treated lateral incisor. So how do you go about it? Uh, uh, you, 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 you need to have the end in mind. How are you going to replace this uh, uh, Edentulous area once the root is extracted. So uh, a careful uh, procedure is done because you may plan for a uh, placement of an implant as well. So for in that case, you need to preserve the bone, both the buccal and parietal bone, so that you get a good uh, uh, primary stability when you place an implant. So this is the surgical site. You place an incision. Uh, and then you can use a Mitchell trimmer. That's a very fine instrument. Uh, in this case, it can be used uh, to elevate the periosteum uh, and then reflect, visualize the surgical area, uh, the surgical site. And you can use use luxators in this case. Uh, if the, like what I said, if if you have to preserve the bone, luxators, luxate it very carefully and get the tooth out. Always remember, as you would have seen this. Uh, uh, OPG, this tooth is a root canal treated tooth. So there is every possibility that this tooth can crumble. The tooth is already brittle. So there is every possibility that the tooth can crumble. So you have to be very gentle. You can spend some more time and then get the tooth out. Or you can you can create some uh, 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 gutter around the uh, uh, root and then carefully Remove the uh, root root stem, and once the root is removed, debride the socket. As I have mentioned earlier, you need to debride the socket, and then close with three zero silk. And uh, you, you need to place only a couple of sutures, and then you can remove the stitches after five days. That is the usual protocol. And uh, as I mentioned, follow up is very very important. See the patient after a couple of days for review. Uh, and and, and uh, after the procedure, prescribe your uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and an antibiotic to go with it. And what, the next procedure, the most common procedure that we do as oral maxillary surgeons are the third molar removal. So what, what are the uh, aspects that you have to take into consideration during your treatment plan? First is the crown. Next is the root. The crown, the size of the crown, if it is bulky, you can you can always uh, expect difficulty in removal. If the tooth is bulky, the crown is bulky. The shape again and the carrier status. As far as the root is concerned, then the size of the root it can be either again bulky. Uh, if the root is bulky, then it's always uh, recommended to section and then get the tooth out. The shape, it can be bulbous or tapered. The curvature, it can be a favorable or a divergent uh, curvature. Yeah, it, it can be a parallel uh, 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 roots if there are two roots and the apical form. Uh, and, and, and if it is a conical root, always remember that it, it, the surgical removal will be a easy one. And again, the number. Usually, as you all know, it is uh, two rooted, but sometimes it can be uh, single root or three roots or with four roots. You never know. So, uh, pre operative radiograph is always a must as far as surgical removal of the third molars is concerned. And what are the radiographs that can be considered? First, you can, you can do an intraoral periapical radiograph. And in case if you do not get the complete coverage of the impacted tooth, then you can opt for a OPG. And also, you, you can keep in mind about the periapical bone loss. In case if there is bone loss, then always you can assume that the tooth will, uh, it will be relatively easy in removal of the tooth. Next comes the angulation. So it is, it is uh, the, it can be either mesiangular, vertical, distoangular, or horizontal. And no, no, uh, no, no procedure 
I mean, no tooth is as easy or as difficult as it can get. And always remember, the distoangular uh, uh, tooth is always difficult to remove. Just because of the path of removal, path of removal, as you as you can visualize, the distoangular uh, tooth will be uh, the, the path of removal will be towards the ramus. So in that case, so that that will be considered a difficult uh, removal. And the depth, depth, the more more deeper the impacted tooth, the more difficult it can get. And uh, during the assessment, you have your war lines, uh, white line, amber line, and red line. And the red line indicates the depth of the impacted tooth. And if it is more than five millimeters, it is considered difficult. And if it is uh, after every five, uh, every millimeter after five millimeters, it becomes three times more difficult. So that is the importance of the depth of the impacted tooth. And also, you have to take into consideration the second molar. The, uh, the size and shape of the second molar, the carious uh, status and restoration. In case if there is a crown or a decayed second molar, uh, you, you need to take adequate precautions not to damage it further. And if it is a crown, if, if, if it, uh, because the path of, I mean, the point of application of uh, the uh, elevator can dislodge the crown or in fact even damage the second molar, the crown of the second molar. Sometimes even a sound tooth uh, can get fractured during the uh, luxation of the third molar. And again, root, the size, shape, and the number, you have to be very careful in case if the root of the second molar is conical in shape. Uh, there is always a chance of the second molar getting luxated more than the third molar. So, the during your preoperative assessment you have to be very 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 careful with taking all these things into consideration and another important aspect is the inferior dental canal so as you can see here the first image shows that the uh, the canal is uh, buckled to the root so you can safely remove it and the second one in case if the radiograph is grooved you always uh, remember that it is going through the canal. So you have to be careful during a surgical procedure. You always uh, recommend sectioning uh, the tooth in this case and removing, I mean, the root very gently, not uh, uh, using too much of force. Uh, or, or else uh, uh, during the post-operative review, you will land up with uh, parasthesia. And another important aspect is the uh, distal bone beaver. Uh, which is again very important. You might have, uh, using the guttering technique, you will remove a good amount of uh, uh, bone in the buccal aspect. You would have uh, used, a, I mean, you, you would have created a point of application. But then if adequate bone is not removed in the distal aspect, the tooth is not going to come out. That is why I mentioned uh, in the, my earlier slides that if there is an obstruction, stop. Do not use all your might to try to uh, luxate the third molar. Uh, you, you may land up with a fracture, not a fracture of the tooth alone. You can, in fact, uh, sometimes land up with a fracture of the mandible. So when there is an obstruction, stop, check. If need be, section the tooth and uh, remove the crown separately, or if uh, warranted, you can remove the roots, uh, crown and roots separately so that you can avoid complications later on. And here it's an example of a mesoangularly impacted tooth. Uh, the, the various uh, surgical, uh, I mean, the incisions or uh, warts incisions, modified warts incisions. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, a warts incision is used, uh, a place to make an incision uh, and, and once the incision is uh, made, you reflect, you use a Havats periosteal elevator and you use an Austin's retractor to retract and then use a, uh, a micro motor. And I would like to make a mention here uh, that uh, use of uh, air rotor is contraindicated because uh, it, it can, it can uh, produce enormous amount of uh, air and you can lead to 
you had emphysema, uh, surgical emphysema. So to avoid that, you need to use a micro motor. And the speed can be a maximum of uh, 30,000 RPM. And uh, the technique here used is uh, a guttering technique. You can also use uh, chisel and mallet, but it is rarely used these days. And this is a guttering technique where you uh, remove bone and the buccal aspect, create a point of application in the me mesial aspect. And in case if it is a distal, a distal angular uh, impacted tooth, then the point of application is towards the distal point, the uh, distal aspect of the third molar. And uh, the point of application, never use the second molar as a fulcrum. It should always be uh, below the C junction. And the uh, uh, internal bone should be used as a fulcrum. Never use a second molar. As I already mentioned, you cannot damage the second molar. You can also uh, fracture the crown of the second molar. Or if the root is conical, you can uh, luxate the second molar as well. So use only the internal bone as a, uh, to luxate. And once the tooth is delivered, remove in case if there is any uh, debris, irrigate the socket thoroughly. If there is any, uh, I mean, uh, tissues, remove it, cure it completely, and then go for a primary closure. And uh, as with any other surgical procedure, follow up is mandatory. Uh, give instruction to the patient that there will be some edema, uh, minor discomfort uh, following the uh, procedure. That is, uh, here is a clinical uh, case where uh, first there is a uh, Watts incision placed and uh, uh, tissue elevated and guttering is being done using a uh, micro motor and then the tooth is delivered uh, and you can see the extracted socket there and then followed by closure in this case. And the next procedure uh, that we commonly do is a uh, endodontic surgery or you can you always also call it as an episectomy. And uh, in this case, uh, for the upper right central incisor, uh, following the root canal uh, treatment, there you, the, you can see a periapical cyst or a granuloma. And uh, one, once you see that uh, periapical cyst or a granuloma, and invariably, uh, you need to go for a periapical surgery. There is also uh, some studies uh, which says that uh, I guess if the periapicalation is less than five millimeters and if the root canal procedure is uh, perfectly done, it will resolve all its own. But then here we are taking a, assuming a uh, situation where there is a, you know, apicectomy is required, is indicated. And then, uh, as I already mentioned, you make a, a incision, a relieving incision is again made, uh, completely visualize the surgical area and uh, at, at this point in time, I will also like to make a mention that the length of the incision does not have any role in healing, whether it is uh, five millimeters or a one centimeter or five centimeters, the healing is going to be the same. So that is another very important aspect that you have to consider during a surgical procedure. Visualization. Unless otherwise you visualize, you will not be able to do a good procedure. So. Uh, reflect it and then uh, sometimes uh, if the, the periapical lesion is quite big then uh, at, at the uh, as soon as you place your instrument here if the Mitchell streamer is used uh, you you will have a I mean uh, the bone uh, fenestration so it, it will be very easy for you to access uh, Sometimes it becomes difficult. In that case, you need to remove the bone around the uh, apex. You, you have to be very careful when you make a uh, remove the bone because you might be very close to the adjacent root. You cannot damage the adjacent root when you are doing an episectomy procedure. And once you visualize that, the granulation tissue, uh, granulation tissue uh, can be curated away and the uh, apex uh, is, is in a clear view. Another uh, indication that I would like to mention uh, is that uh, uh, once the granulation tissue is removed, it will stop bleeding. That's an indication to say that you have 
the granulation tissue is completely removed or in case if it's a periapical cyst. So once, once the tissues are removed, then you can use a rosette uh, burr, I mean, a, a flat fissure burr to remove the uh, apex uh, of the root and that again can be removed. And then it, it can be uh, at an angulation of 45 degrees so that you can visualize the apex. And then it, it, that's something called uh, a retrograde filling. A few surgeons uh, do retrograde filling, few just use a burnisher and then burnish the apex. And uh, both are equally acceptable as, as long as you get a very good uh, seal, uh, apical seal. And uh, here in this case, uh, what, you, what you can see is a, a small rosette burr that is used to prepare an undercut cavity uh, and uh, amalgam or uh, glass enamel uh, cement can be used uh, to seal the uh, root apex. And uh, once, once that is done, uh, uh, achieve hemostasis and closure of the womb is done. Next is uh, uh, phrenectomy. That is again a very common procedure that is done by maxillofacial surgeons or uh, periodontists or uh, even a dental surgeon can do this procedure. And uh, here in this case, the uh, example is for the uh, orthodontic uh, considerations. As you can see, a high labial attachment, uh, you can have a, a, a mid labial uh, diastema, diastema. And uh, unless otherwise uh, you get this phrenectomy, labial phrenectomy done, it is going to land up in, uh, I mean, the, uh, what do you call the uh, relapse of the orthodontic uh, treatment. So during the procedure, some, some orthodontists uh, recommend uh, before the start of the procedure, some recommend during the procedure, some recommend after the procedure. Personally asked me, I, I, I would like to do it during the procedure. In my experience, that works well. And here, you can, you can hold it by a, a hemostat. The, uh, the frenum, the label frenum is uh, held uh, with a uh, curved hemostat uh, and then, uh, uh, Number 15 BP blade is used uh, to trim the two uh, on, on either side of the uh, frame. And then once, once you uh, excise the tissue, the tissue is removed. And uh, what, what you see at the end is a diamond shaped defect. That is how it will look like once the uh, frenum is removed. And uh, then you place a, a suture. Suture, and uh, as you can see, the alveolar side of the wound may be dressed with a periodontal pad if required, uh, if there is any uh, ooze bleeding, or uh, yeah, most of the time you might not require one. Require one, and this is how it uh, look like after the uh, placement of sutures, and this is a follow-up picture after the suture removal. Uh, another very important uh, uh, indication that we very commonly see in your now day to day practice is the uh, presence of supernumerary tooth. Supernumerary can be a, in form of a, an impacted tooth, can be, can be a delayed uh, eruption or an ectopic eruption of the adjacent tooth. It can be due to a prolonged retention of uh, uh, DSDS, crowding, development of immediate uh, diastema. It can be uh, due to eruption into the uh, floor of the na nasal cavity. Uh, it, it can also be responsible for uh, formation of some cystic lesions if left behind and they are impacted. And it can also lead to root resorption of adjacent teeth. So when you have all these uh, indications as far as the supernumerary tooth is concerned, they, you need to get the supernumerary tooth removed. As you can see here in the image, there are multiple supernumerary tooth. How do you address them? Now, how do you maintain the oral hygiene of these patients. Uh, it is very difficult, very difficult. So in such situations uh, require, it, it is not about aesthetics in this case, it is about periodontal, uh, uh, it, it is about periodontal uh, consideration. And uh, uh, 
so what are, what are the reasons for extraction of uh, erupted supernumerary tooth and uh, erupted supernumeraries should be preferentially extracted except in cases where the supernumerary teeth need to be retained for example in cases of adjacent uh, tooth which is clinically missing and uh, missing uh, uh, where, where uh, the supernumerary tooth uh, can be used as an abutment. So that is another important aspect. And in cases where reshaping of the mesodents is done when the primary incisor is lost prematurely and the I mean, permanent incisor is not at erupted. So these are the situations where you can retain the supernumerary uh, teeth. And, uh, uh, and when, when is it that the supernumerary tooth are indicated for uh, removal? You see, unerupted tooth can be associated with complications, and those not associated with complications uh, can be kept under periodic review. So, if the supernum unerupted supernum is associated with any complication, then it has to be surgically removed, and uh, it can be delayed if the supernumerary tooth is placed very close to the apices of the developing permanent tooth, as you can see here in this uh, OPG. And if the formation of the supernumerary uh, tooth is in the initial stages. And the procedure uh, used to do this uh, for, for the removal of the surgical, uh, I mean, for the surgical removal of this impacted tooth is as uh, would that you would follow for any, uh, I mean, removal of the impacted third molar. Uh, the next uh, procedure is the uh, pre-prosthetic uh, surgery and there are various uh, methods, in fact, uh, the procedure that I discussed earlier, the uh, or what, you, what you call the uh, label phrenectomy, it is one of the pre-prosthetic surgical procedure as well. It is a procedure of the soft tissue, uh, but I brought it in that uh, heading where you consider that for the orthodontic consideration. Here, and the smoothening of the utensilous uh, ridge is the most uh, common uh, incident that you will see uh, uh, following extraction. And you, you, after the extraction, if you can spend few minutes more in making that uh, extraction socket smooth and then uh, uh, compress the socket, then you'll, you'll be doing more good than harm to the patient. If not, you will have to do a secondary procedure, like uh, what is indicated in this case. Uh, the patient goes for a prosthetic rehabilitation. Uh, the prosthodontist takes a look at the utensilous uh, arch. Uh, and if, if, they, if they feel that there are some undercuts or if there are some bony uh, projections, then the patient is referred back to the oral surgeons for the uh, pre uh, for this procedure to be done. You make an incision, a crystal incision is made, uh, it's reflected, and here again the instruments used for reflection is uh, a Howard's Perias elevator and also a Mitchell Strimmer. A Mitchell Strimmer is a very good instrument uh, to reflect in these uh, situations. And once the uh, uh, ridge is exposed, you can use a, uh, a, a, a bone file, a ronger. In case if it is very sharp, you can use a bone ronger. You can use a bone file, or if you, you can also use a round burr at a slow speed, and then you can get the uh, bone bone uh, smooth, and then get a primary closure. So as you can see in this picture, the uh, bone is made smooth, and you get a primary closure. And the image what you see on the right is a follow up uh, after the uh, procedure is done. And uh, yet another uh, common condition that we see uh, is uh, uh, fibrous tuberosity. Uh, is, some, sometimes you can see a very bulky uh, tuberosity, uh, which will affect the, uh, the uh, retention of the denture. So you make a incision right through the uh, fibrous uh, tissue. And then a wedge is created, as you can see in the right top uh, image. Uh, and it is uh, uh, wedge is cut free at the base and then removed. It, uh, debulking is done. One, one, once the debulking is done, then uh, the size of the uh, tuberosity, the fibrous uh, tissues are removed. And then you get a uh, 
a, a good uh, closure and and then uh, you can you can uh, follow it up with uh, good closure and uh, in case if the patient is a denture uh, the there and then you can use a zingox regional paste over the denture so that will that will uh, support the tissue in its new position and then sutures can remove after 7 days otherwise uh, it, it it can uh, again uh, lead, lead to an unesthetic uh, uh, tissue and uh, another important aspect uh, that we can come across is a denture induced hyperplasia again the similar kind of a procedure is followed i'm not i don't want to go into the detail hyperplastic tissue uh, uh, is, is a uh, short thick deeply clefted lump as you can see here uh, when you see this kind of a, a, a lesion uh, it, it, it has to be removed primarily because you cannot leave this and uh, for a long time and the denture induced uh, hyperplasia can lead to uh, malignancies later on if left untreated and uh, the procedure again is the same uh, incision is made and uh, held with uh, 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 forceps and then the tissue is incised at the base and the final strands of the fiber tissues are removed and uh, uh, sometimes you can encounter bleeding from this uh, situation i keep it mostly from the capillary uh, capillaries and then you get a primary closure and always remember after these procedures to send this tissue for biopsy it, it might look uh, innocuous but then it is always better to send this tissue for uh, histopathological examination and get the uh, report uh, and another uh, uh, important aspect uh, that you can come across uh, another important thing is that uh, a mucosine what, what is a mucosal? It is a uh, extra recession cyst. Uh, and most common area that you can come across this is the lower lip due to a uh, uh, sharp tooth or uh, I mean, uh, lip biting habit or uh, something of that. And then you, the procedure is that you infiltrate uh, with local anesthesia. And the elliptical incision is made, as you can see here. And uh, the, the uh, mucosa is grasped with the tooth forceps uh, with the upward traction is applied and uh, uh, sharp pointed scissors are inserted into the with the blades closed into the tissue between the cyst and the mucosa and the tissues are bluntly dissected uh, away by open the blades as you can see in this picture uh, so that you don't uh, damage the, the minor salivary gland and then the steady upward traction is uh, maintained and eventually the cyst is uh, free. And sometimes uh, uh, you, you can see some very like minor salary glands attached to the base of the lesion. And uh, they can also be removed uh, free with the help of the scissors. And the closure, the underlying connective tissue and the muscle can be seen in the base of the wound. And uh, bleeding can be controlled with a uh, aid of the uh, assistance finger pressure and then uh, mucosal layer closure is done followed by the uh, excision and this is how it will uh, look like following the procedure and uh, in case if there is a sharp tooth uh, then you, you can uh, make the make the sharp tooth uh, uh, you can you can smoothen the sharp tooth and if the patient has got the lip biting habit you can uh, advise the patient not to, I mean, uh, do that habit. And uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, please send the tissue for research pathological examination. Uh, and uh, that, that was a mucosal, what you saw. And this is a, 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 a cyst of the maxilla. It is a radical cyst. Again, the procedure is the same. And uh, as you can see here, it is a complete uh, enucleation of the procedure of, of the cyst is done do not leave behind uh, uh, any any tissue uh, if, if you are leaving behind any tissue it can always recur it, it can recur in the form of a residual cyst so uh, see to that you the complete uh, sinus lining i mean the cyst lining is removed 
and you get a very good primary closure. Biopsies, uh, that is another uh, important aspect and I would like to uh, make a mention of uh, caution here that uh, as, as soon as see a pathology, do not always go for a, uh, a place of blade over the lesion. Sometimes uh, it, it, it can uh, be a vascular lesion. Inadvertently, if you uh, place your uh, knife over a vascular lesion, you're asking for trouble. So always get a specialist opinion before you do any uh, biopsy. Uh, that is a disclaimer. And uh, here in this case, it's an excision of a fibroepithelial poly from the palate. And uh, a stay suture is placed, as you can see here, to hold the uh, tissue. And then, uh, uh, and 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 you, and you can hold it. Otherwise, it is very. It, it will become very difficult to hold such a lesion. So uh, it, uh, suture is placed. Uh, it's transfixed with the suture, and it can be held with a uh, needle holder. And and then uh, use a, a BP blade. And then uh, the stalk can be cut free with the scalpel, with the uh, removing completely from the uh, base. And and uh, the residual defect will will be rough roughly uh, elliptical in uh, shape. And uh, closure, the edges of the wound are again undermined because as you know, the palate is very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, taut and it is difficult. So you need to undermine the wound edges to enable a good closure. And the needle is held and in order, uh, in, the, in the needle holder with a generous bite, the tissue is taken. And again, as I mentioned earlier, histopath sent the tissue for histopathological examination. This is another case. Uh, this is a uh, patient with uh, diagnosed with uh, CA, squamosal carcinoma of the tongue and the floor of the mouth. Uh, uh, this is a clinical picture. And uh, ag again, as I mentioned earlier, in the previous slide, uh, you, you, can, you can use a suture to hold the tongue. Uh, or you can use uh, some gauze and uh, hold the tongue on the, uh, so that you, you have a control over the tongue. Otherwise, the tongue, as you know, it's a, a very mobile organ and you will not be able to get a proper, uh, do a proper procedure. And uh, the other important uh, uh, procedure that uh, you, you, you can uh, come across or uh, you can do is uh, oral, closure of a oral fistula. When, when does a, uh, what, what is a communication, what is a fistula? Communication is what happens during the procedure. And if left untreated, and if, it, if, the, if the defect is more than five millimeters uh, in, in, in diameter, and if it is left untreated, and if there is a, a, a fistulous uh, tract that is formed, then it can lead to a oral antral fistula. And uh, in this case, what, what you can see is uh, during the extraction of the buccal root uh, of the uh, first molar, uh, the root has been displaced into the maxillary sinus. So then there are two things, uh, two tasks at hand. First, to remove the uh, root and to close the fistula. And uh, the radiograph confirms the root fragment in the maxillary sinus. So how do you uh, close it? The socket of the upper uh, right second molar is filled with uh, blood uh, clot, uh, as you can see here, and the buccal gingival margin is intact. And uh, there are various uh, techniques. One is the buccal advancement flap, and the other is the uh, palatal advancement flap. Uh, if the size of the lesion is small, it's uh, five, six, seven millimeters, you can always use a buccal advancement flap. And in case if the size of the uh, the defect is more, and then the palatal advancement flap is uh, recommended. And one disadvantage with the buccal advancement flap is that uh, following the procedure, uh, there will be a loss of uh, uh, the sulcus depth, uh, so the prosodontist might find it difficult to get a, a proper uh, uh, retention in that uh, area. So you have to take uh, these two uh, things into consideration. And the incision, two short relieving incisions can be made across the gingival margin towards the sulcus, as you can see here. And, and the few uh, loose fragments of bone are removed from the socket 
and you get a very smooth uh, uh, bony socket. The reason is again, if there are uh, the bony uh, margins are sharp, it is it is going to damage the tissue, the the flap, and it is going to result in again a failure. So uh, in this case, the root uh, is is uh, grasped with a fine straight forceps, removed. The tooth is withdrawn through the socket itself. In case if you are not able to do so, you can always do with the Calvillic procedure. I am not going to explain the Calvillic procedure here. It is done through the socket here, and the periosteal lining of the flap is incised and posteriorly to allow it to be drawn across the socket without any tension. And this is how the closure will uh, look like. The first two sutures uh, uh, oppose the corners of the flap of the palatal socket margin. Look at the tissue; it is completely covering the socket, so that the uh, you get a primary closure and further suture repair uh, the buckle repair the buckle relieving incisions and close the central portion of the wound so you get a yati closure and uh, follow up uh, uh, i mean you can you can give a amoxicillin and uh, ephedrine nasal drops can be prescribed I, you can you can uh, ask the patient not to sneeze violently so that uh, at least for the initial few days and uh, inhalations can be prescribed for the next five days. Uh, this is another clinical picture that we have done in our department, uh, where uh, buccal advancement flap is done. To uh, you can you can see in the second image there is a, uh, a, a, a huge defect, and uh, a buccal advancement flap is done to close for closure. So now I have. Uh, discussed about the procedures uh, that are done. Now, what are the risks and problems associated with uh, minor surgical procedures? As I uh, mentioned earlier, it's not about doing the procedure. It is about patient reporting to you with uh, no complaints. That is when your job is done. So what are the uh, complications? Uh, first and foremost is the preoperative assessment and uh, uh, concerned issues for an extraction of tooth. Because as you know, once the tooth is removed, it is, becomes an irreversible procedure. So you have to be very, very careful uh, in identifying the right tooth to be extracted. The extraction of wrong tooth is a crime. And uh, you need to ensure that the decision is taken for the right reasons. Uh, and the patient should uh, be an active participant in decision making whether uh, or not there is a reasonable alternative. In case you, you, can, you can give an alternative uh, to extraction that that should always be suggested like uh, the form of a root canal treatment or something like that and uh, he uh, also remember that healing is not always a straightforward outcome the patient should be prepared for adverse uh, adverse outcomes too you, you need to educate the patient in that uh, situation because the patient might uh, come back to you with uh, because not all the patients have the same pain threshold uh, not all the patients will have the same inflammatory reaction. So you need to inform the patient well ahead uh, in advance. And uh, a note on medical history, that is again very, very important before you do any procedure. The history taking is very, very important. And uh, it is very important to note any condition that may predispose to a medical emergency during or immediately after the extraction. So if an uncontrolled habit, I mean, uh, hypertensive patient can lead to uh, uh, in uncontrolled bleeding, patient with hemophilia, uh, uh, patient with liver diseases. So you need to take all these uh, aspects into consideration before you embark on any procedure. And uh, if any history that may lead to an increased risk of osteonecrosis or osteoradionecrosis also should be taken into consideration because sometimes the patient may not inform you that the patient is undergoing any radiation. Uh, so in such situations, the, pay, the history is very, very important. And then update medical history with specific answers being given by the patient to specific questionnaire, duly signed and dated by the patient is advisable. That completes your, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the informed consent procedure. The dental history, why do, you, why, do, why do you want to know the dental history? If the patient has had any teeth removed previously, and if so, whether there are any difficulties or complications that will make you prepare. So if the patient might come and tell you that the last thing there was an extraction 
they had uh, difficulty in removal. So that, that, that should uh, uh, ring an alarm bell in you. You, you can you can plan accordingly, just in case. Uh, if, if you are if, if you feel that uh, even a soft tooth which need not be sectioned, it might come out easily. But if the patient gives you a, a previous history, you can always go for a sectioning of the tooth, in, even if it is a first molar maxillary or mandibular first molar. Section the tooth, remove the roots uh, separately. So that is a and radiographs. Always do radiographs because the amount of uh, radiation exposure is very minimal uh, following an intraoral radiograph. So radiographs and uh, uh, and and in case, God forbid, there is a litigation, you can always go back and say that yes, this is a tooth which is uh, uh, indicated for removal. So uh, radi radiographs are a very important. Uh, armamentarium in your history uh, and and uh, it, it, will all, it, it, it will always be uh, easy to justify and exposing a patient to a, I mean ionizing radiation when removing one or more mobile lower incisor teeth with advanced periodontal disease and uh, while the other extreme is to uh, clearly sensible to take a preoperative radiograph of an extensively broken down upper second molar of a tooth in case a patient uh, history of difficult extractions. So uh, complications that could arise uh, proceeding with the procedure without a radiograph, you can you can come across an adverse tooth configuration. Uh, risk of fracturing the maxillary tuberosity is high. Uh, uh, the proximity of maxillary sinus. So when when you do a radiograph, you, the relevant anatomical features may be determined from the uh, radiographs. Uh, uh, which are already done. And if a decision is uh, to be made to extract the tooth without taking a new radiograph, even you can go back with a uh, previous uh, radiograph already done and then uh, correlate with the clinical records and justify the extraction uh, uh, and with the clinical findings and then still you can proceed with the uh, extraction. And what are the complications at the time of surgery? Uh, before uh, you agree to undertake any extraction or any other form of minor surgery, it is important to consider and discuss with the patient in advance uh, each of the possible potential complications uh, it might throw. In some cases, uh, an extraction would be made considerably easier if a surgical approach is taken in this, uh, uh, allows the operator to uh, visualize the root anatomy more clearly, as I uh, mentioned earlier and uh, access in case if you require uh, any bone removal you, you can always plan well in advance and uh, identify a suitable point of application for the use of elevator and even when the need for surgical approach is not obvious at the outset uh, suitably equipped sterile surgical tray with the surgical handpiece and girth should be readily available you can always be prepared uh, uh, with a sterile uh, instrument set ready, just in case if something goes wrong. When you are when you are doing a routine extraction, just in case it lands up with a intra, I mean, transcellular extraction, you can keep the surgical uh, set ready. And what are the post-operative complications? Sometimes you can leave a retained root behind. Uh, literature says you can. Uh, Leave, leave a epical third just in case you justify the leaving behind the root um, more than removing. For example, I can give you an example. If, if it's a maxillary first molar or a second molar and if the palatal root is very close to the uh, maxillary sinus, it is all or it is into the maxillary sinus, it is prudent to leave the, max, the root epical third of the root. Uh, rather than meddling with it and then pushing the root into the maxillary sinus. Uh, but remember, inform the patient. Make a note in your case, your case uh, record that you have left a apical third behind so that there is no future uh, issue later. Next is uh, extraction under uh, GA or sedation. And it is important to establish with certainty which teeth uh, are scheduled for extraction. Yes. As you know, the patient is sedated, so you need to get the consent prior. 
Uh, and this might occur when carrying out extractions on the advice of an orthodontist or if you're working in a specialist oral surgery practice or one which accepts referrals for the treatment of patients under GA or sedation because uh, the patient might be referred from somebody else with a note. So you need to uh, doubly sure uh, and go through the uh, uh, clinical examination again. Uh, make sure you are doing the right, uh, extracting the right tooth uh, before you proceed further. So that uh, brings the, an end to my presentation. Thank you for a patient listening. And these are my uh, references. And I'm ready to take any uh, questions if there are any. I think. Can I stop the screen share? Or? I'm not audible. I mean, I, I cannot hear you. Thank you very much for the very useful insight into minor surgical procedure, sir. Thank you for taking your time. As of now, we do not have any questions uh, here. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think I have one question here by Chandramohan Yadav. Sure. So, can you see the question? Yeah, yeah. How do you avoid vascular malformations? There, there's a very good question. Like as I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, uh, do not uh, uh, put your scalpel in any uh, tissue for uh, biopsy. Uh, you need to palpate and see if, they, if there if there are. Uh, I mean, uh, what what do you call? Uh, if it's a vascular malformation or if it's a. Uh, Thing, then, then you'll have palp I mean, the, the swelling will be palpable. I mean, you'll have uh, 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 the, uh, the you'll have some uh, pulsations. Sorry, you'll have pulsations over the surface of the lesion. So, in that case, you have you have to be uh, careful. You need to do your uh, uh, investigations before you do. You do a CT with contrast, and before you place a scalpel. And uh, you, when you place the scalpel, you need to take adequate precautions. Uh, you, you need to do it under uh, uh, careful, uh, uh, what, what do you call the uh, precautions in the theater, in the theater. So pulsations, in case if you have any pulsations in the surface, the likelihood of uh, vascular malformation is, is there. Yeah. OK. Uh, as of now, these are the only questions. Okay. Well, uh, with this, uh, thank you once again, sir, for your insight into minor oral surgical procedures. It was quite an extensive coverage, which uh, I think most of the uh, general dentists will be very useful for a general dentist. Uh, with this, uh, I with this we can end the broadcast here. Okay. Thank you once again for all the viewers to logging into Mansa University. Please look forward for your for the upcoming webinars, uh, which will be broadcasted here live on the Mansa Facebook page. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Jimson. Thank you, thank you uh, to Team Mansa for this opportunity.